Professor, you talked about respect. You talked about political influence. Some of our viewers might ask, how can you use these two words when you talk about an ape? What would you answer? Well, uh, political, I, I wrote early in my career a book called Chimpanzee Politics, yep. which is about the politics of chimpanzees. And the reason we speak of politics in chimpanzees is because the rank order is not determined by how big you are necessarily. So, in, in, for example, in chickens, the, the rank orders, the pecking order was discovered in chickens. And in chickens, the, the biggest, meanest chicken is at the top. In chimpanzees, sometimes the, the smallest male can be the alpha male. And that is because it's not decided by how strong you are. It's decided by coalitions, as in human politics. It's decided by how many friends you, ha you have and how, how loyal are these friends and do they help you. And so a male who is very diplomatic and has a lot of good connections with the females and with some other uh, male friends, he can get to the top. And then, of course, he needs to do his friends favors because otherwise, why would they support him? So he, he needs to let the, he needs to share food with them, or he needs to let them mate with females, or uh, he needs to do favors back for the ones who have done favors to him. And in chimpanzee society, that's such an important part. It's called reciprocity. You need to exchange favors all the time. You groom the ones that you want to share food with, and and so on. And so it's a it's really a political system. Um, and, and also, um, it, it has another interesting parallel, is that if an alpha male is not a good alpha male, like he's a bully and he terrorizes everybody, and he's a terrible alpha male, then sometimes um, they get rid of him and they, they revolt or, or uh, they wait for the occasion that somebody challenges this male and then they put all their support behind the challenger to get rid of the alpha male. And in the wild, we have now like a dozen cases in the field of chimpanzee males who have been killed. And so they are bad alpha males. And it's not just that they chase them off, they, they kill them. And uh, in captivity, there's a tendency. We, we, we usually see this coming and we remove the male before it can happen. Um, but um, yeah, it's a very political system. And an alpha male who is good, who, who, who keeps the peace and, mm -hmm. and, and is not overly aggressive, they try to keep that male. And so if he's challenged by a younger male, uh, they're going to support the alpha male because they want to keep this male. Uh, I keep on thinking of some of our viewers who might say that when you say political influence, when you talk about politics concerning primates, this is rather a metaphor than something very precise and that you help yourself in order to make a description of the life of some animals. How would you answer to that? It's more than a metaphor. It, it might be a metaphor if I were talking about, let's say, the octopus or about um, some distant species. Um, but um, chimpanzees are our closest relatives. And so we share nine, more than 99% uh, of our DNA with them. We, we are very, very similar to them. And, and my rule of thumb is if you have related animals who do similar things, like the politics of humans and the politics of chimpanzees or any other process, mm -hmm. you have to use the same terminology and you have to interpret it in the same way. So if, let's say, Horses and zebras do similar things under similar circumstances, have similar behavior. We use the same labels for their behavior, and we have the same theories about their behavior. And, and, and our relation with chimpanzees is not so different from horses and zebras. We're very close to them. And so if chimpanzees have coalitions uh, in their power struggles and do favors for each other, uh, and we call that in humans, we call that politics. I don't see that as a problem to calling it politics and, and chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. When you wrote the book, did you imagine that people reading it will be flooded with emotions? Did you? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I foresaw that. I, I think people underestimate the force of their emotions, especially men. 
men have this illusion, and you can see that in the philosophies of big thinkers, they have the illusion that they are rational beings, that they are run by the, by the, the, the mental capacities that we humans are so proud of, and that we decide things rationally, and that the emotions, they play some role, but not so important. Uh, and uh, in my book, I try to explain that a lot of what you, we humans do is, is guided by the same emotions as we see in animals. Uh, I think um, the ratio, the, the, the rational processes are less important, actually, than we think. If you think of the biggest decisions you take in your life, let's say, who you're going to marry, that's a very big decision, it's maybe the most important decision. <laughs> Is that a rational decision? No, there's very little rationality involved. It's a very emotional decision. And um, I think this is true for many decisions we, we, we make. And so I think we totally overestimate the, the rational, the, the reasoning and logic in our life. And, and this is also, by the way, this is the reason men look down on women and humans look down on animals. Is, is men think women are too emotional and humans think animals are purely emotional, uh, which is really not true. They, they are just as emotional as we are. Um, but, but the Western male especially is very good in suppressing emotions. And, uh, and, and I think in my book, I try to explain all the ways we express emotions, all the ways they influence us, all the ways they are very similar to what we see in an elephant or what we see in a, in a, in a chimpanzee. And um, people, yeah, people may be sometimes a bit uh, impressed by that, um, uh, and and it, it it arouses maybe emotions in them. But I think that's fine. I have a quotation from yourself, and uh -huh. it says like this: "Quote, science doesn't like imprecision, which is why when it comes to animal emotions, it is often at odds with the views of the general public." Ask the man or woman in the street if animals have emotions and they will say, of course. They know their pet dogs and cats have all sorts of emotions and by extension they grant them to other animals as well. But ask professors at a university the same question and many will scratch their heads, look bewildered and ask what exactly you mean. End of quotation. Professor, do you have a short and how shall I call it? It's not about being convincing. It's about, I don't know, being spectacular. Do you have a spectacular definition of what emotions are? Yeah, emotions are um, a state of mind that, that is actually also a body state. It, it, emotions live between, between the mind and the body. They, they, they involve both. They, they always involve the body. Uh, if, if you are very emotional, if you tell me I was very emotional and nothing happened to your body, to your face, your voice, your blood pressure or whatever, I, I doubt that you are very emotional. Emotions so emotion involve involves your body. Yeah, and it prepares the body for certain actions. So, so the body is prepared for flight, if it is fear, for example, for attack, if it is an anger. So, so, or yeah, you have sexual emotions, you have all sorts of emotions that prepare your body for a certain course of action. There may be emotions that don't prepare your body, maybe there are religious emotions or some emotions that, that don't result in action, but most of the emotions prepare you for certain actions that are adaptive. And that's why the emotions, um, they evolved over time in order to create actions in mm -hmm. the animal. Uh, and the, the beauty of emotions is that the actions are open. So, so we used to think when we thought about animals, we thought about instinct. We would say the animals have an instinct for this or an instinct for that. But instinct is a very rigid concept. It's like you, you're gonna do this because you, you have been pre-programmed to do this. Emotions are much more flexible. So, so let's say you see a scary object like a snake or you see a car coming at you, right. uh, this will induce fear. The fear emotions prepares you for action, which is usually to get out of the way of the danger. But maybe getting out of the way is not the best thing to do, or maybe there, there are different ways of doing things. So animals may freeze when they see something scary in order to not be detected by the predator, for example. They may escape up a tree. 
they may escape uh, on land. Um, so, so there are many different actions that are possible, and that, that's what emotions do. They prepare you for action, but still what kind of action you take is up to you. And, and so that's the beauty. It's much more flexible concept than, um, than instinct. And, and animals are basically guided by, the, by their emotions, and I think humans most of the time also. Thank you.